Hi everyone, my name is Intisar Kanani and I am the author of Thorn and most recently a companion, uh, the beginning of a companion duology to Thorn called The Theft of Sunlight. So I'm here today to talk about three tips for writing Mighty Girls. Um, my tagline is writing Mighty Girls in Diverse Worlds and um, as we start this talk I just want to clarify that my wheelhouse is writing girls. Um, however, the tips I have for you today may still be useful or thought-provoking regardless of what gender you're writing. Um, so I just want to put that out there. Um, if you're writing non-binary characters, if you're writing male characters, these may still be helpful, but I am going to be speaking specifically to writing girls. So my first tip for you today is to redefine mighty. What does it mean to be mighty? Girls in young adult, and especially fantasy, which is what I write, um, when they're historically written as strong, we've seen it mean that they can beat men at their own game, right? So this is about strength uh, in terms of ability as a warrior, as a uh, assassin, um, in terms of power as a mage or witch or wizard of some sort who has an equal magical power or greater than those around them. And we need these stories. We really need the kick butt heroines who will physically thrash the other guys out there, right? And I, I enjoy those stories too, so there's nothing wrong with that. But um, I'm going to challenge you to think about um, mighty in a different way. So defining it this way, strong or capable, uh, m girls have to be mighty in a traditional male way, right? So this is, this is defined by what we'll currently call the patriarchy, right? Um, and I want us to reclaim ways of being mighty uh, that are often seen as being, or dismissed as being weak or feminine, right? So you can be mighty by being kind. You can be mighty by being compassionate or merciful or having forgiveness, right? And we dismiss these things as being weak. And why? Because our patriarchal power structures have defined those things as both feminine and unworthy or weak. Uh, and I'm going to go out there and say one of the most powerful things you can do one of the most life-changing, game-changing things you can do is be kind, right? So what does it look like to have a character who is mighty through kindness or compassion? Think about the character traits that you would automatically dismiss as weak or effeminate and ask yourself, what would those look like as superhero talents, right? Like what, what would the world look like if your character save the day through compassion and what would that how would that change the story what would happen it doesn't mean that it's not going to be a high action um, fast-paced plot you can still have that but what happens when a character actually values the lives of other people um, that, that they don't know over over their own needs, right? So all of a sudden you have a character who's like, no, I'm not gonna kill random guard just to get away because random guard is still a person and they don't know that they're doing anything wrong, right? And that changes the narrative. It builds complexity into our stories, but it also um, helps us rewrite what it means to be strong or right or mighty. So rethink your definitions of mighty. That's my first um, tip. My second tip is to consider the journey that your character is on, right? Um, this is about structure, but it's also about the arc of the main character. So we're going to talk about a couple of different uh, character arcs or journey structures that are common in the West. There are many, many, many kinds of narrative structures. And the Western Europe and European and um, North American focus is pretty narrow. So I guess the first thing I'll say is if you're interested in other narrative structures, read widely, look at folklore and oral traditions and uh, 
literature coming out of different cultures from around the world, saturate yourself in that and discover that. Recognizing that um, any time a book is translated, the, the story is innately changed, right? So when it's being adapted for a Western market, there will be changes that happen, uh, either subtly or not so subtly. So that's something to be aware of, but you can still learn a lot about diverse story structures by reading widely. So I'm gonna recommend that. But the other thing I'm gonna talk about is the two more common structures that we see here in the West. And the first is called The Hero's Journey. Uh, many of you may be uh, familiar with it already. It was uh, first theorized by Joseph Campbell. Um, and it uh, basically features a main character who you know goes on a heroic quest they uh, are called to the quest they refuse it they're forced onwards and as they go forward in their journey towards um, fighting off the villain however that may be they're kind of honed as a tool or a weapon um, you know if you uh, are familiar with the lord of the rings you can think of frodo who becomes in essence, only a ring bearer. He's nothing else. And it's a story of isolation, right? You have a lone hero. It can only be them. They're the chosen one. They, they, they have to face the hero, uh, sorry, the villain alone. And um, it comes down to this uh, focused fight. And um, eventually they, they win, hopefully. Sometimes if it's adult literature, they lose and that's miserable. Um, this is why I don't read a lot of adult lit. Um, and, uh, and the hero's journey is, is really about uh, isolating your hero and honing them into a particular force to be reckoned with that then uh, is the only answer to saving the world. Um, the heroine's journey uh, has been around uh, for an equally uh, uh, long time in literature. So Hero's Journey, you know, Campbell goes back and shows its existence from thousands of years ago in Greek and Roman stories. Um, the heroine's journey is the same, right? But uh, it first was discussed in the 1990s from a psychoanalytic point of view. Uh, I'm going to refer specifically to the recent publication by Gail Carriger, whom you might know of as the author of The Parasol Protectorate, among other books. Um, and she wrote about the heroine's journey um, just this past fall of 2020. Her book came out. And again, she, she connects it to, you know, thousands of years worth of narrative uh, stories in the West. And it's a, it's a whole different arc for your character. It's about building alliances, right? So your heroine goes off on her quest, not because she's forced onward, but because she's trying to help something or save something. So she's not going forward for glory. She's going forward for change. And over the course of the story, she builds alliances. She delegates power. She she compromises and she creates networks of support so that when she gets to her final showdown, it is a moment in which everyone and everything she has built comes together to create an, a scenario in which uh, they can succeed together. And um, this concept we see Throughout literature, um, we see it a lot in the romance genre, this kind of journey, right, where we're building community, we're building families, we're building partnerships, and the way you succeed is together. And we don't see it so much anymore um, in, in young adult fantasy and in, in, in young adult literature as much outside of the romance genre. So I want to take a moment to think about it because... Um, the hero's journey is a very male patriarchal journey, right? It's this idea of the lone, uh, strong, mighty hero who does his work um, alone. It's, 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 it's like it just it keeps sledgehammering the alone aspect of the story. Um, the heroine's journey 
you know, we don't hear about it that much. And part of that academic slant against it is because it was a story of women's journeys, right? Of, of uh, and if you look at folk tor folklore and myths, this was the journey that women went on. This was how we changed the world. And honestly, this is how change happens. Like change very rarely happens with one person doing one magical thing, right? It happens because networks uh, are built and communities push for change. And so I think we do our young people a disservice when we suggest that like, hey, only the chosen one, even if they chose themselves, only the chosen one can do this. Only one person can make this change because in the world that we're living in right now, we all need to make change and we need to do it together. And uh, the heroine's journey is a, a character arc journey and structure that shows uh, and delves into the possibilities there. So I'm going to encourage you to consider the journey that you put your characters on. Don't default into what you're most familiar with. Don't default into the hero's journey. And if you're really familiar with the heroine's journey, try other journeys. Investigate. Um, because complexity in your story structure and um, in the arc that your character goes on is going to build beauty into the story. It's going to reflect um, different ways of being, and that is so, so, so important nowadays. So that's my second tip. And my final tip is to consider relationships. Consider the relationships that your mighty girls might have, right? So um, at, the, at the risk of uh, um, being booed out of the room, I'm going to say having a love interest is fine, but it is not everything. Uh, I actually <laughs> told my husband once we were, I was particularly frustrated. I was reading a book in which a girl had to choose between saving literally the universe or being with this boy that she had known for roughly one and a half weeks. And I turned to my husband and I said to him, if you have the choice between saving the universe and saving me, you better choose the universe. And he kind of spluttered. <laughs> he didn't know what the correct response was to this. And I was like, there are other fish in the sea. And he's like, I love you. <laughs> I didn't really mean to put him on the spot. He didn't know where I was coming from. But um, we have a tendency in writing YA to put an extreme amount of focus on our love interests. So one aspect of this tip is don't make your love interest everything, but the other aspect of it is think about all the other relationships that exist in our lives right now, and then ask yourself if they exist in the stories you're writing, right? So um, one main tip for me, one main pet peeve for me is how much family does not play into YA, right? So in order to grow up in YA literature, you either need to be an orphan, you need to come from a broken family that you then somehow leave, or you need to just run away, right? You, know, you need to be abducted or kidnapped or something. You've got to get out of that family situation so that you can grow up. And realistically, most of us have to navigate becoming an adult while maintaining contact with our family. And most of us would not choose to get rid of our families. There are absolutely broken families and dysfunctional families and horribly abusive families. And we do need stories um, about characters who deal with that and, um, and get out of that. But that isn't every story. <laughs> and um, and it, when you look at YA, it kind of looks like it is every story. So what would it look like if you had to save the world with parental support? What would it look like if um, you went off to fight your battles and your younger sister had your back, right? Like, this is a whole different kind of story. And this is, as a woman, as a girl, these are the relationships I had. You know, my best friends were there for me. So again, friendship, right? What about non-romantic friendships and relationships? What about girl friendships, right? Sisters um, that, uh, you know, not just found family, but literally friendships that existed from before the story started uh, that build out the relationships and, and power of your character, right? So this is not 
we are not on the patriarchal hero, hero's journey, right? There's a reality of our lives, which is that we are connected. Uh, most of us have at least one friendship somewhere that in some way supports us. And so why don't our characters, why do our characters always end up with nothing or, or their only focus is their love interest? That's not healthy. None of us, I don't, you know, not to give marital advice, but most of the people I know whose only friend was their spouse ended up really unhappy because that's too much for a spouse to carry. Like, you still need other friendships. You still need uh, ways to navigate and handle your world, and one person cannot carry all of that for you, right? Um, so... This final tip is to consider the relationships that your uh, main character might have and develop complex, deep relationships for them. Quiet moments of togetherness as well as those high action points, right? Um, so those are my three tips for you. Um, it was uh, redefining Mighty Girls considering the journey they're on, and considering their relationships. All of these um, are going to help you create more complex, thoughtful stories. Not that, when I say thoughtful, again, it doesn't mean that it can't be a plot-driven story, but it does mean that you're going to be developing a more unique story because you're diving into who your people are, how they change and how the world changes around them and what it means to be strong outside of very traditional ways that we have lots of books already exploring, right? So explore, explore more, widen your net. Um, I do have a final bonus tip and it's very simple and that is to just have fun. So um, this is kind of a abstract chat about uh, building and creating Mighty Girls, but writing is about, for me, it's about finding joy and uh, the characters that I'm writing and the stories that I'm telling. Um, not that I don't have darkness and sorrow and tragedy in my books, but the act of writing is a joyful act. Um, I love what I do. It is sometimes absolutely work, and any any. Anything that you do as a job is going to have a little bit of grunt work involved somewhere. But it's really important to not get lost in the woods and let writing um, become exhausting for you or, or just grunt work. So my final, my final tip is to uh, give yourself grace. Enjoy the ride. Um, if you're not enjoying it, fill, refill your creative well. Uh, do things that you love, experience new stories in whatever form works for you, experience new things overall, go out and do something new, um, let yourself uh, recharge. We're still in a pandemic and it can be really hard to write now, so give yourself grace, love what you do, keep writing. I can't wait to see what you do. Have a lovely day.